Six years ago, my best friend and I decided we wanted to produce a documentary film about Bigfoot in Kentucky. Dash and I had been considering this for a while. So when we finally decided to venture out into the woods, we agreed on one thing, to go well armed. Our mission was simple, to film some footage in the woods of Kentucky, seeking out Bigfoot. Finding this creature was truly not necessary, nor was it an integral part of the process. We had already lined up several local eyewitnesses, a professor in the study of cryptozoology, and a few authors to give their expert opinions on the subject. This trip was simply to get some good overnight footage of us camping in the woods, also to capture us overreacting to the sounds of the night. Our first witness we met was a 65-year-old single female who, while driving home one night, witnessed the creature crossing a road and almost hitting her car. She claimed that the creature was 8 feet tall and was able to cross the 26-foot wide roadway in three quick steps. Not very far from where she had her encounter, a gentleman was exiting the back door to his property, and he saw a similar creature, 8 to 9 feet tall, 600 pounds, jet black hair, and bulging muscles walking across the back of his property. This creature looked in his direction, grunted, then disappeared into the wood line. We asked to be granted access to his property, that way we can camp where we knew there was activity. There was a hollow towards the back end of his property where he said he would hear the sounds of screams at night. In my mind, this was the perfect place for us to set up camp. Now, DW, I can't stress enough that this project was not very sophisticated. We had no thermal cameras, no trail cameras, not even a voice recorder. We only went on with two rifles, two cameras, and a tripod. As night fell, we set up camp and started a fire. We arranged our tents side by side, with one camera on a tripod opposite from us facing the tents, and the other handheld camera with us to document our conversations. Sitting by the light of the fire, we discussed the possibilities of this small documentary earning us a healthy sum of money on YouTube. We discussed our marital problems, our children. It was just two friends hanging out in the woods talking. As the night progressed, there were a few sounds that startled us, but nothing happened that gave us any sign of the presence of Bigfoot. At least not until we separated and headed into our tents to bed down for the night. Laying there in my tent, the sounds of the woods went silent, almost as if someone had pressed the mute button on a movie. I never knew how intense silence could be until that night. Then from all directions, I could hear heavy footfalls moving in fast. Not at a running pace, but almost as if someone was walking briskly towards us in the woods. I whispered to Dash, Did you hear that? And he replied, Yes, accompanied with this shaky, jittery tone in his voice. But not only let me know that he heard the same thing I heard, but he was scared to death. The sounds coming from the north, which was behind our tents, east and west, simultaneously stopped. However, the footfalls coming from the south continued only slower. I yelled out, hey, whoever's out there, identify yourself. We're armed, and I'm going to come out shooting. With those words, all movement stopped. As I grabbed my rifle and positioned myself on my knees to exit the tent, we both heard a long, heavy, breathy groan. Unzipping my tent, immediately I saw a set of eyes the size of golf balls in the tree line just beyond the position of our camera. Then they blinked and motioned left to right as if they were looking at something in the immediate area. Scared, I fired my rifle straight up through my tent and yelled, get the hell out of here. That's when there was this humongous roar that came from right behind our tent. The noise was deafening. I could feel the vibrations through my body as my muscles started to tense and my body shivered. Then, even faster than these creatures moved in, they retreated, moving in the same directions they came. The sound of tree limbs breaking and tree branches snapping was coming from all directions. And then, there was nothing but this awkward silence. Ten minutes later, the sounds of the woods came back on again. We packed up our shit and left headed back towards the landowner's house. When we arrived, it was four o'clock in the morning, and he was sitting on his back porch drinking coffee. 
He said, I figured you boys would be headed back up this way after all that noise I heard down there. Did you find what you were looking for? After that night, we completely abandoned the idea of doing a Bigfoot documentary. Things had gotten entirely too real for us. And what we experienced, I wish upon no human being. DW, our mutual friend gave me approval to share these Bigfoot encounters with you. He says that not only do you do a good job, but you can be trusted to keep everything on the side of entertainment. Our encounter with two male Sasquatches happened on an extraction mission. Two pilots had crashed in South America, and it was our job to recover both. We were dropped at the landing zone via helicopter and into the woods immediately. Terrain-wise, it was light forest and provided good lines of sight. During our briefing, we were told that there would be hostile activity in the area, so our six-man team moved quietly as possible. The first two clicks were quick, and we made good time. However, soon our point man gave us the hand signal to hold in place. Now looking back on it, the woods had gone completely silent, which is a sign that there's some form of contact in the area. But at the moment, I wasn't sure, and neither was anyone else on the team. Seconds later, he gave the signal for us to proceed forward. And as we move, we begin to hear this knocking sound. The sounds were coming from both east and west of our location. However, there was nothing in our line of sight. Now, when you're in a situation like this, you fall back on your training. So we prepared to engage an enemy coming at us from both sides. We held our positions for over 10 minutes, but saw and heard nothing else. So again, we moved forward. The next three clicks were the exact same way. As we moved through this area, it was completely silent, and then the knocking started escalating. These sounds were coming from all directions at this point in time, north, south, east, and west. This whole thing was confusing. Enemies don't give away their location under any circumstances. Either they retreat or they attack. So by now, we would have seen some sign of an enemy combatant. We moved from hand signals to verbal communication because clearly someone or something knew we were in the area. And when we finally made it to the crash site, our first objective was to retrieve any sensitive data. So we set a perimeter and began to search the area. To the north of the crash site, the woods were far more dense and dark. And as I stood there, I couldn't help but feeling like someone was over there looking back at me. Several of the other members in my team also verbalized this feeling of something being off and that we needed to get moving. By the time we moved to phase two of our search, which was seeking out signs of survivors, we all had already noticed what looked like drag marks where bodies had been pulled from the wreckage. These marks went on 15 feet and then stopped and were flanked by large footprints. These prints tracked north into the more dense wooded area. Not sure what could lead these tracks, our commanding officer decided we should proceed with extreme caution, and his instincts would turn out to be totally correct. The events that happened next were not only terrifying, but made me a believer in Sasquatch. Entering into this wood line was like entering into another world. The terrain began to slope downward, leading into this massive valley. After an hour, we found ourselves at the base of this valley. The sunlight struggled to break through the trees, creating these shadows and giving this area this 100% creep factor. I remember thinking to myself, very few humans have ever set foot in a place like this. It just felt like somewhere we were not supposed to be. By now, we had no more tracks to follow. We had gone way beyond the crash zone. And if there was a survivor, he wouldn't have moved into this type of territory. Coming to the conclusion that we were not about to find these two pilots, the CO signaled for us to head back uphill. And as we moved upwards, our point shouted, contact left. Up ahead on our left, I saw something I thought was not possible. Jumping down from a perched position within the top of two trees was this huge, massive thing. When it hit the ground, it let out this roar like nothing I've ever heard and began pushing trees over in our direction. This creature was huge, 10 feet tall, and covered with hair. 
I believe we all were in complete shock when we first saw it. Because number one, nobody opened fire. And number two, everybody's eyes were wide open. Then a second one let out a roar from behind us. And that's when his shit hit the fan. Engage! I took up position with the three other team members and engaged the creature up here. This thing was fast. I mean, very fast. And it moved quick on two legs. The two team members close to the base of the hill engaged the second creature while dodging a tree that it pushed down on them. Then it retreated off to the east, and for a second, things went quiet. So we began a tactical retreat, leapfrogging uphill back towards the wreckage site. As we moved up this hill, we could hear what sounded like thunder coming from the valley below. It sounded like 100 of these things were rushing through the valley at us all at the same time. It took every bit of my mental strength not to freak the fuck out. When we arrived at the top of the hill, my CEO called for an extraction two clicks to the southwest. And when we finally reached a designated landing zone, I asked him, what in the hell was that? And he said, son, those are the things of nightmares. Everything, everything, everything gonna be all right this morning. Oh, yeah. Woo! Dog Waters, after talking to you, I realized What's up, why ladies and gentlemen, it's your boy Dog Waters, and I'm back again dropping another story. This one is a Bigfoot story. Pretty good Bigfoot story. For those of you who are members of the website, you've already heard it because it's been there for a while. For those of you who are non-members, you're going to listen to it now. Also, for those of you who are non-members of the website, the lottery is open. I was supposed to open it this weekend, but I did it already. So head on over, click the button that says Dark Waters Lottery, submit your email address, name and email address, for a chance to win a 30-day membership. For those of you who are going to be like, uh, Dark Waters, I don't want to give you my email address. Listen, I'm doing this because I told y'all the reason why I built the website because I knew about the censorship. Now you're seeing the second phase of the censorship rollout. And I'm not going to bite my tongue for nobody, baby. It's eventually, it's going to get to the point to where I'm going to say something and they're going to get pissed. Because they've already shadow banned me based on other things I've said. And I'm going through a series of big interviews going into February where I know I'm going to say some things that may be a problem. So sign up, become a member, or submit your, your name and... Uh, flying at 20,000 feet. Our team, which is led by my best friend Steve and I, are on our way to Ruby, Alaska in search of a monster known to many as Bigfoot. I used to have a job, but I got laid off. I used to have a wife, but she said she had enough. I used to have a car, but it got repossessed. It seemed the Lord have found someone he likes to test. I've lost all the make a lose, that's why I sing the blues. I used to have a home that burned to the ground. I used to have a dog, now there's nowhere to be found. I used to have money to buy. Now, let me get this off my chest. I want to start off by saying, fuck Bigfoot and everything about him. For years, them damn Bigfoots have been nuisances on my property. Killing my dogs, stealing my chickens, fucking my cows. Bigfoot and I have had such a contentious relationship around my property that I've shot him. I tried to burn him. I've used bear traps on him. You name it, I tried it. It wasn't until these dog men showed up that them Bigfoot bastards decided they was going to leave. And you know what? I'm happy that dog man is around. 
Now, before I go into my dog man encounter, which is creepy and scary, let me tell you about my Bigfoot experience. The one that pushed me over the edge last year. You see, my septic tank at my property got clogged, right? It caused feces to back up and overflow all into my house. So I call out a treatment crew. They dig it up, open it up, and they get to work on a Friday. That evening, they left the tank open and placed a solution in it to dissolve the clog, and they said they would be back Monday. So the entire weekend, my property smelled like shit. Now, I'm out in the woods rabbit hunting. And if you know anything about Bigfoot, you know that they leave these markers. Areas where they break trees, they break limbs, all kinds of stuff. And me personally, I have my own markers in the woods. I found it to be the best way to stay out of the area. So I tie ribbons on trees to give me an idea of where they are and where they're not. So I guess I must have gotten too close, right? So I hear this bastard tearing through the woods, coming straight at me. Now you gotta understand, I've been dealing with these things for years. And I know it's not the one that's coming directly at you that you have to worry about. It's the other one that you don't see or don't hear that you need to be concerned about. So I take off running, heading back to my house, and I'm hauling ass through the woods. I hit the clearing onto my property, and when I look back over my shoulder, there's two of these fuckers closing in. Now, now these creatures don't move like you see in the movies. Their motion is a little bit different. Yes, they can run on two legs like a man, but also they can gallop forward on all fours, similar to like a gorilla. Now, one is running, and the other one is galloping. And I know I can't make it into my house. So guess what I have to do? I jump into the open septic tank. And yes, I dive into a big pile of shit. And when I finally stand up, one is looking down at me with his forearm covering his nose. The other one is circling the tank. I was forced to stay in that shit for about 25 minutes until these bastards decided they were going to leave. That day I had enough and I decided I was going to go buy the biggest dogs I could find. I ain't talking about regular dogs. I got two Neapolitan Massives. These weren't pets. These were guard dogs. And very expensive. The first day I let them loose on the property, a Bigfoot came around. And together, they were successful scaring them off. But a week later, the two got separated and I found one of them dead, neck broken and lodged in a tree. After that, the other dog decided he was going to stay out of the woods. And hell, I couldn't blame him for doing that. So a couple of weeks passed, right? I'm out there working on my truck. I got it jacked up and I'm up under it. And I see my dog going to the edge of the woods. He's sniffing around and kind of just being nosy. When I peek my head back over, there's another black dog over there with him. Almost the same size. From a distance... It looked just a little bit bigger. Next thing I know, these two are gone, off running through the woods. I'm thinking, hey, he done found him some doggy coochie. You know, this is a good thing for him, right? It never occurred to me. What the hell was this other big ass dog doing around there? And where did it come from? I was so engulfed in the work, I just didn't think about it. Nighttime comes, right? And I'm thinking, oh shit, them big foots done got my other dog. But he comes running out of the woods, all excited and happy, and lays down on the back porch. And I say, you a bad mamma jamma. You went inside them woods and they didn't even get you? After that, I headed inside, take a shower, put some dog food out for him, and I go to bed, right? That morning, I hear him barking. And I mean, he's going crazy. It's like 2.30 in the morning. When I head out of the back door with my flashlight, he's right at the edge of the wood lines. And as I shine the light in the woods to see what he's barking at, oh my God, I see the set of eyes shining. And I swear to you, they're about 10 feet in the air. And I'm like, oh fuck, this is a big one. So I'm telling him, here boy, come here. Here boy, come here. I'm calling the dog and he ain't coming. He's just yapping, barking away. And I'm thinking, this big foot about to grab you and break your neck. Here boy, come here. Come here boy, come here. And as I'm trying to inch closer and closer to him, I'm steady calling him, here boy, here boy. I'm struggling to keep the light on this thing. Then I hear these heavy breathing and these steps coming up behind me. And before I could turn around, these two humongous black wolves, dogs looking things. I mean, these fuckers are big. They're zooming past me. So close that one of them brushes against my shoulder. Yes, I said it brushed against my shoulder. I'm fucking five feet nine. These things were big. And that's when shit went bananas. 
those two things jumped straight into the trees and it sounded like nothing I'd ever heard before. Bigfoot screaming. My dog is going crazy. These bastards are tearing the woods up right in front of me. I was able to catch these little glimpses of the fight by the flashlight. I saw my dog attacking the Bigfoot's leg. And then I saw one of the other ones. I can't call them dogs because dogs don't stand up. I got a glimpse of this thing standing up trying to bite Bigfoot on the back of his neck. I would say this went on for about 5 to 10 minutes. Trees are breaking. Shit is flying. I mean, trees are falling over. And then I heard them all run deeper into the woods. I'm standing there like, what the fuck is going on? I was so shook up that I went inside and opened a bottle of whiskey. I was standing there taking a drink and I'm thinking to myself, it's fucking Jurassic Park around this bitch. I thought to myself, I want to call somebody and tell them what's going on, but who in the world would believe me? The next morning, I went outside and my dog is laying on the back porch sleep. He had a huge chunk of flesh missing from his shoulder, scars on his face. And when I took him to the vet, she asked me what kind of dog had he been fighting, assuming that I was into illegal dog fighting or something. Now, I couldn't tell her what really happened, so I just kept my mouth closed. A few days later, animal control comes over to my house. They want to ask questions. And I tell them, listen, he ran off into the woods and he came back just like that. You're welcome to go into the woods and figure out what did this to my dog, but I don't know. To which they replied, no, sir, we just wanted to make sure you're not endangering the animals. So these two clowns walk around my property like I got hundreds of dogs tied up and I'm Michael Vick or something, right? Then they leave. Now, now, since that incident, I haven't seen Bigfoot at all, and I'm fucking happy. I do see Dogman from time to time. And we, me and my dog, haven't had any problems out of them. The worst thing I've encountered is I shot a deer and they decided they was going to take it. But hey, that's a small and price to pay to have to what he was talking dog. about until my first daughter, Kim, was born. I was away fighting in Afghanistan when my wife gave birth to her, and she was a perfectly healthy little girl. By the time I got back from fighting, she was about two years old. and She and I instantly bonded. Now, I had to do a second tour, 24 months, and by the time I returned, Kim was six going on seven years old. At that age... She was just old enough to realize what her father was doing and begged me not to go back and work. And so I didn't. Finally, things around my household were going well. I mean, extremely well. And then one day, the shit hit the fan. You see, Kim went to a public school and her teacher decided to have a career day. So when the teacher asked my daughter, what did her dad do for a living? Kimberly said, my daddy kills people for the government. And when I grow up, I think I want to work for the government as well. Oh, shit. You guys just don't understand how this went down. The teacher took her to the office. The principal calls my wife. My wife calls me. Next thing you know, my wife and I are in the office with the principal. And this Oreo cookie brother, black on the outside, white on the inside, is telling me that my child needs to seek counseling. When my wife and I go through the process of trying to determine how he came up with this decision, he said it was not based on his education or his background, but because he felt like she was making up lies and she was suffering from separation issues with me being in the military. I sat back in my chair and told him, who told you that I was in the military? And then this look came across this man's face. You know that look of confusion and dismay? I could see the gears turning inside of his head. And then my wife excused herself and stepped outside. The second she closed that door, I turned to him and said, my daughter is perfectly healthy and she's not lying. Secondly, my daughter has no reason to lie. This man looks at me and says, so you kill people for a living with this smart ass little attitude. And I said, I wouldn't say that's all I do. But from time to time, it's a part of the job. Then he asked me the wrong question. Who do you work for? Which to my reply was, none of your goddamn business. But if you have any further questions, I can have someone contact you and explain it to you in detail. This dude was arrogant, smug. He didn't even believe me. You know, I had to deal with this type before. You know, the king of his own castle. Just a flat out asshole. The following day, the school receives a call and the problem went away. 
So three weeks after that incident, my wife decides that she and Kim are going to go visit her sister in Oklahoma for the weekend. And that's when things started to get weird in my life. The evening they arrived, my brother-in-law Temp calls me and says, Hey, the girls made it here. Everything is cool. And we start shooting the breeze. Now, Temp is a highway contractor and works jobs for the state of Oklahoma. The conversation spills on and he goes into how he wanted me to help him get a security company up and running so he can bid on some more jobs and state contracts. Now, it was during this conversation that I started to hear the girls screaming. And then this commotion, doors slamming, my wife panicking, Kimberly crying, saying it tried to grab me, it tried to grab me. Then the phone went dead. You see, the town that they were in, in Oklahoma, was about two and a half hours away from me. And after I done called them three, four times and it's going straight to voicemail, I hopped in my truck and was on the road. It took me about an hour and 45 minutes to get to the house. And when I arrived, all the lights were off on the inside. The front flood light was broken and Temp walked out of the door looking spooked. I'm like, what the fuck is going on, bro? And that's when I saw my daughter, Kim, standing behind him. And the look on her face was pure fear. And my wife, Kat, was in tears. Now I'm starting to worry and get really, really concerned. And at that very moment, I realized that something was extremely wrong. Something bad had happened. Cat walked me inside, sat me down, and told me what she saw. They were all outside in the backyard. Cat and her sister sitting on the back porch, Temp at the grill. Kimberly and her cousins were throwing rocks in the pond right by this wood line. Cat told me that's when she looked up and saw what she thought was a man standing in a tree line wearing all black. But before she knew it, he was closing in on the kids. She screamed at what she thought was a man and took off running towards the children. And the way my wife described this to me, she said that this humongous arm long reached towards Kim. And that's when she realized that this was no man. There was no man on the planet whose arm was that big. And then she saw an erection. Her screams made Kim freeze in place for a second. And then my daughter took off running, racing towards her mother. Now, while my wife is explaining all of this to me, my daughter, Kim, is clinging to my waist. And next to me, Temp is standing there looking pissed off. It took hours for everybody in their house to calm down. The next morning, Kat, her sister, and all the kids took the two-hour drive back to my house. Temp went to work, and I went into the woods. Now, I need you guys to understand something. At this moment in time, I did not care if it was a man or a beast, and I didn't know what it was. All I knew was something bad happened to my daughter, and I was going to find out who or what did it. And the first signs I found was a print right near the pond, 16 inches, pressed deep into the soft, wet ground. Whatever this was had to be at the pond before sunrise. That's when I realized that this was not a man. It was some type of creature. Now, Oklahoma has always been known for having aggressive Bigfoot activity. I decided the best way for me to enter those woods was not from the property itself, but from the highway. So I called Temp, told him where to meet me and where I was going into the woods at. It took a while, but I was able to work my way from the highway through the woods all the way down to where I paralleled the area where the pond was. And then I picked up another print. I was able to follow the trail of those prints for about 100 to 125 yards. Then I got to this real thick brush, thicker than anything I've ever seen. And from there, I had to find a way to work around it. Now, when I got on the other side of this brush, there were signs everywhere. Tree bricks, high, low, trees that had been freshly pushed over. So many signs of activity that it made it hard to tell which direction this thing was traveling in. So I just picked a direction and kept moving. I figured whatever was in here, either knew I was there or would find me. I had been walking for about 15 or 20 minutes, and I start to hear this tree knocking. Now, I need you to understand something. While I was out there, I didn't know what it meant at all. But I knew something was watching me. I could feel it, sense it. Working in my profession, you develop a sense of these things. Your body tells you when you're in danger. And something was there. I just needed it to reveal itself. So I moved deeper into the woods, and as I moved, I silently charged my AR-15. Now, from the time I charged my weapon to the time I engaged this creature, it had to be about another 50 to 80 paces. But that's when I heard this roar coming from behind me. Deep, strong, 
it literally shocked my nervous system. Now I've been battle tested and nothing has ever made me freeze in my tracks like that. I couldn't even move or think for about four seconds. And when I turned around, there it was. Now this thing looked human, but slightly retarded. Black hair, head elongated, teeth black and dirty. And when we made eye contact, it had this look in his eyes like I'm going to kill you. But when I motioned to raise my weapon, this thing's facial expression changed. It recognized that I had a weapon. And we both knew that it was in trouble. My first shot was not to the head or to the chest, but to this creature's knees. Two, three round bursts. And it let out this yelling, groaning sound and took off running. It, when I say it moved fast, it moved fast. And I know I hit this thing in its knees. I took off behind this thing, waiting for the perfect time to fire again. And as it ran, it literally was knocking trees over with its forearms. I was committed. I didn't give a fuck how many trees it threw. All I knew was I was going to get it or it was going to get me. Now this thing moved so fast that it had gotten damn near 75 to 80 yards ahead of me through the woods. I could damn near barely see it. All I could see was the trees swaying and moving. And then it started to slow down. It stumbled a bit. And as I closed in, I heard another one coming from behind me, screaming and yelling. And I remember thinking to myself, you can bring your ass if you want to, but your friend right here is about to get it. And as I closed in on this thing and it stopped running, was kind of walking at this fast pace, dragging his right leg, unable to bend his knee. I was about 15 to 20 yards away from this thing when it turned and looked at me. Those eyes now look completely human. I could see the fear, apprehension. And even the regret. The same look I had seen in men's eyes all over the world. From Cambodia to South Africa, Afghanistan, Antarctica. The look a man has when he realizes he's about to die. I emptied my magazine into the back of his head and neck. It stumbled forward hitting the ground. Right shoulder resting up against a tree. And then I took off running as fast as I could in the direction of the highway. When I got there, I was out of breath. And I knew it was more than back there. I could hear them yelling, screaming. I called my brother-in-law, Temp, and within 10 minutes, he was there picking me up. When I got in his truck, the first thing he said was, did you kill it? Yeah. What was What's it? Up, what was it? It's your boy, it Dog Waters, and I'm back again, dropping another story. This one is a Bigfoot story. Pretty good Bigfoot story. For those of you who are members of the website, you've already heard it because it's been there for a while. For those of you who are not members, you're going to listen to it now. Also, for those of you who are not members of the website, the lottery is open. I was supposed to open it this weekend, but I did it already. So head on over, click the button that says Dark Waters Lottery, submit your email address, name and email address, for a chance to win a 30-day membership. For those of you who are going to be like, uh, Dark Waters, I don't want to give you my email address. Listen, I'm doing this because I told y'all the reason why I built the website is because I knew about the censorship. Now you're seeing the second phase of the censorship rollout. And I'm not going to bite my tongue for nobody, baby. It's eventually, it's going to get to the point to where I'm going to say something and they're going to get pissed. Because they've already shadow banned me based on other things I've said. And I'm going through a series of big interviews going into February where I know I'm going to say some things that may be a problem. So, sign up, become a member, or submit your, your name and uh, email address in the lottery and get down with the get down. You know what I'm saying? But if you want to hear this full story, you need to be a member. You're going to need to be a member, baby. Peace. Man, look, I'm tired of people talking about Bigfoots like they're cool. The majority of these people that talk about Bigfoot ain't living nowhere near no damn Bigfoots. Because if you did, you would realize quickly that it's like having a 2,000-pound stalker watching your every move. 
No, 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 no. To make it even more clear for you, it's like having Mark Chapman outside your house 24-7. Combine that with the fact that my family's business is tomato farming, and now you realize that not only is Mark creepy, but his bitch ass is greedy too. Let's start off with this, the stalking. Yearly, we have migrant workers that work our fields. And every year, a percentage of our workers ghost us. I mean, one day they're at work, the next day they're gone. Now, when this first started to happen, we as an organization were confused because we pay them fair wages and we only use people that have work permits and we take good care of our people. Now, one of my employees, China Bob, we call him China Bob because for years we couldn't pronounce his name. So finally, he got disgusted with people mispronouncing his name and he told us to call him Bob. Now, combine that with the fact that we have other men who work for us named Bob, it's better to call him China Bob. Just like the black man that works for us is called Black Bob and the white man that works for us is called White Bob. It's just a way of distinguishing who they are. Anyway, China Bob comes to me a few years ago and says, hey, I figured out why our workers are going to work for other farms. Goes on to tell me that we have a yearling that comes on our farm. Now, he goes on to tell me stories about when he was a kid and how they had him in his village and how they had to go out and kill them, and how it took a hell of a lot of bullets to kill these things. Now, I need you to understand something about me and the concept of there being a Bigfoot. I knew there was a possibility that something like that existed, but as far as I was concerned, the possibility was about 5%. So as China Bob is telling me this, I'm looking at him like he's done lost his damn mind. We go back and forth talking about this for about five minutes and agree to disagree. But he leaves me with this ominous warning saying, look, you always leave the farm and head home in the middle of the day. If you stick around here at night like some of the other employees have to do, you will see this thing here on the farm. Now, the following morning, I'm in the office, Black Bob walks in, and I spark up the conversation with him saying, hey, have you seen anything weird on the property? He looks at me, what the hell are you talking about, look? And I said, well, have you ever seen anything like a Bigfoot out here? Black Bob goes on to tell me that sometimes when he's out here working late at night, he feels like something is watching him, but he never knew exactly what it was. So I decide the only way to get to the bottom of it is to stick around and see for myself. So picture this. I'm sitting in a chair, leaning back, smoking a cigarette, relaxing. And to paint a picture for you of how a tomato farm is set up, if you imagine being inside of a baseball stadium and you're at home plate, you got the first baseline, the third baseline, and then the stadium makes an arc that goes all the way from third base around through left field, center field, so right field back to the other baseline, right? That's how our tomato form is set up. And then we have our tomatoes planted in tiers that step up every 10 feet. So essentially, if you're standing there in center field and you look around, you're completely surrounded by tomatoes all the way up to 50 feet in the air. Now, like I said, I'm sitting there smoking my cigarette, right? Look up and I see something running. And it's running pretty fast too. It's up high on the fourth tier running behind the tomatoes and it's moving from right field headed to center field. Now listen to me, when I tell you this is about 120 to 130 yards away from me, but it's big. I can see that it's big. So big that I say out loud, what the hell is that? Now understand, I'm not sitting there in complete darkness, but the big lights, the ones that we use to illuminate the crops during harvest time, those were off. So I get up, walk over, turn the switch, and turn those lights on. But with these lights, they don't just come on and flash brightly. They're a lot like football field lights. You turn them on early and then they kind of warm up. And then next thing you know, it's super bright outside, right? The second the lights click on and the dim lights start to shine, it freezes right there in center field and tries to hide behind the tomato plants. But it's way too big. And even though our plants are strung up in the air, you can still see this thing standing there. And even at that distance, I could tell that it was some kind of giant hairy man. And then, next thing you know, a fucking tomato comes flying at me, lands at my feet. And I need you to think about this, understand how far away this creature was. And it threw a freaking tomato that landed right at my feet. I stand there watching it as it's watching me. Next thing you know, another tomato comes flying at me and lands on the wall right above my head. And for me, it was at that point in time where I had seen enough and I said, fuck it, I'm turning off these lights and going my ass home. The next morning, I get to work early and I find China Bob. He's standing there drinking coffee with Black Bob. And I go on to tell him 
about the events of the night before and he starts to laugh at me i'm talking about bent over at the waist laughing saying i told you so but you wouldn't believe me after he's had a good laugh he says now that you understand what's going on i can explain to you boss what this thing is costing you because that big giant hairy monster is eating your tomatoes from there china bob and i go into this discussion of how to get rid of this thing i tell him look maybe we can leave the lights on all night long and that'll keep it away he says no all you're going to do is run up your power bill and it's going to sneak in and still eat your tomatoes so then i suggest that look maybe we just shoot it and get rid of it he says no that's not a good idea because right now all it does is sneak eat some tomatoes and go on about his business you don't want to piss this thing off after going back and forth for another 10 minutes me making suggestions and him shooting them all down we decided the best thing to do was leave it alone for now and hopefully it would just go on about its business but it didn't the next day my wife is sitting in a truck on the back side of the property and she sees it peeking at her from behind the tree she completely freaks out damn there runs over one of our employees trying to get the hell out of there now understand our house is on the same property as our farm and it was like once this thing laid its eyes on my wife, it went into full stalker mode, turning its attention from the farm to my house. Now it's peeping at her through windows, and it's gotten to the point to where my wife doesn't even want to be at home alone. Remember, prior to this, I didn't even believe that these creatures existed, so I didn't have the luxury of understanding all of their behaviors. But one night, my wife had some friends over for wine. I leave the house to get some cigarettes, and when I drive back up to the house, I see it standing outside of the house looking through one of the windows. So instead of pulling into the driveway, I drive past the house and then walk back with my rifle. Now, I'm in the woods across from my house looking at this thing through my scope and it looks like a giant, hairy, retarded Shaquille O'Neal. But with these exaggerated features, a bigger head, bigger brow, bigger lips, wider nose, standing there watching them through this little sun window we have at the top of the living room wall. Now, I got this thing in my scope. I could shoot it in its ear, its head. I could hit it in one of its eyeballs if I wanted to. But then it looks over at me. And I swear to you, I'm concealed in pitch black darkness. And this thing is looking at me. I'm like, looking down. I used to have a job. Okay, now you know Dark Waters is not about to give it all away for free. Want the rest of this story? Go to IamDarkWaters.com and become a member today. Only $4.99 per month gives you access to this library of true horror stories. Become a member today. I am darkwaters.com. Enter the realm of the paranormal and unknown if you dare. Hear the chilling true stories told in Dark Waters' own gripping voice will keep you up at night. Tales of shadowy figures, strange creatures, and disturbing entities that lurk in darkness. Become a member for exclusive access to the full archive. Visit imdarkwaters.com and remember to leave the light on. You're listening to Dark Waters Radio, the premier destination for paranormal and cryptid encounters. Get ready for storytelling perfected with your host, the godfather of dogman stories himself. With over 300 interviews conducted around the world, Five published books and founder of DogmanCams.com under his belt, Dark Waters has cemented his status as the authority on all things strange and frightening. From dogmen to ghosts, witches, and government conspiracies, he's heard it all. After taking a short hiatus, Dark Waters has returned in full swing to once again evolve the landscape of true story narration. His gripping accounts of supernatural run-ins will have you on the edge of your seat. So turn down the lights, settle in, and prepare to believe the unknown. The Godfather is back, and he's ready to introduce you to creatures, specters, and phenomena you've never heard of. Storytelling perfected. This is Dark Waters Radio.
Johnny, let's go. Get inside. Let's go. I knew we shouldn't have come to his event. That son of a bitch does this every time. He always has to try and find a way to show me up. And you know what, babe? The last time he did some shit like this, I should have punched him in the nose. Had I punched him square in the nose, he wouldn't be playing these games that he's playing with me right now. But no, I wanted to be the peaceful one. I wanted to be the one who turned the other cheek. I'll tell you what, I won't be doing that with him ever Honey, again. don't you think you're driving a little fast? These back roads are so dark and windy. Listen, forget about the road, babe. What I'm trying to explain to you is this. This guy is a piece of shit. Besides, I know this road like the back of my hand. I hope so. I'm getting creeped out by all these trees. It's so easy to imagine something jumping out. Like what? A dog, man? I done told you a thousand times, babe. You listen to that crap way too much. There's no such thing as a dog, man. Did you see that up ahead? I think something just ran across the road. That's probably just a deer. I don't know. It looked bigger than a deer. Slow down a bit so we don't hit anything. What the hell is that Oh thing? my god. Look, it's coming towards what us. What the fuck is that thing? Stop screaming, babe. Hold on, hold on. head oh honey are you okay honey babe babe where are you oh what the fuck where's my cell phone son of a bitch i gotta get out of this car Damn it. Babe, where are you? Now you see, this is a bunch of bullshit right here. I'm trapped in this car, and what the hell is that? Is that coyotes? Is that wolves? We don't have wolves around here. I gotta get out of this car. I absolutely gotta get out of this car. Hold on. Wait. This is right over there in the distance. Hey! Hey, hey, hey! Help me! Hey, I'm out of here! Help! Help! an encounter with the elusive cryptid known as Dogman. 
At HuntDogMan.com, we document sightings and expeditions searching for proof that this beast exists. Share your story and listen to chilling Dogman accounts from others who have glimpsed the creature. Learn about upcoming outings you can join to hunt for evidence. Uncover the truth about Dogman at HuntDogman.com. Do you crave adventure off the beaten path? At eerieexpeditions.com, we take you on guided tours of the world's most haunted, cursed, and mysterious locations. Visit castles, asylums, murder sites, and more on our one-of-a-kind excursions into the dark unknown. Meet expert guides and use state-of-the-art equipment to hunt for paranormal activity. Voyage into the eerie and macabre at eerieexpeditions.com. The journey begins now. I am darkwaters.com. Enter the realm of the paranormal and unknown if you dare. Hear the chilling true stories told in Dark Water's own gripping voice will keep you up at night. Tales of shadowy figures, strange creatures, and disturbing entities that lurk in darkness. Become a member for exclusive access to the full archive. Visit IamDarkWaters.com and remember to leave the light on. So I heard Dark Waters talking about the courts of heaven, so I started studying it, got books and read the Bible and realized it was real. I followed the steps to get there and found myself having an out-of-body experience. Understand, I had taken DMT trips, but this was nothing like that. I was in a giant courtroom and there was a judge so big I could only see his foot. I tried to look up at his face, but it was too bright. Then I looked to my left and there were these dark presences there, pointing at me, accusing me of being a bad person. Then I saw my dead mother standing, looking up, talking to the judge, pleading with him on my behalf. This scared me so much I snapped out of it. I haven't had the nerve to go back since. I will never forget when God showed me a person placing a curse on me. They went to a graveyard, found a headstone with my name on it, took graveyard dirt from the grave, and cast a spell with the intent to kill me. Why? Because their feelings got hurt. The funny thing about casting spells is that a curse without a cause cannot stand. So now, this guy at my job goes around spreading rumors, turning people against me, trying to create a cause for his curse to work. I pray to Jesus and he says, do nothing, be still. This goes on and gets worse and worse, everything to try and get me to fight, be offended, so his curse could land, but nothing. Jesus says to me, son, I paid the price for your sins. So he is not cursing you. He is cursing me. I will deal with him. You're listening to Dark Waters Radio, the premier destination for paranormal and cryptid encounters. Get ready for storytelling perfected with your host, the godfather of Dogman stories himself. With over 300 interviews conducted around the world, five published books and founder of dogmancams.com under his belt, Dark Waters has cemented his status as the authority on all things strange and frightening. From dogmen to ghosts, witches, and government conspiracies, he's heard it all. After taking a short hiatus, Dark Waters has returned in full swing to once again evolve the landscape of true story narration. His gripping accounts of supernatural run-ins will have you on the edge of your seat. So turn down the lights, settle in, and prepare to believe the unknown. The Godfather is back and he's ready to introduce you to creatures, specters, and phenomena you've never heard of. Storytelling perfected. This is Dark Waters Radio.
So most men have a problem with spoiling their wife. Me, I never had that problem. As far as I was concerned, I didn't have an issue with dropping you off to work, picking you up from work. I don't have an issue with opening doors and closing doors. In my mind, I'm always at competition with another man. So guess what? I'm going to do everything that that other man would never do. So when you run into an opportunity or you have a chance to meet some random guy and you decide you're going to talk to him, you'll quickly come to realize that he doesn't know how to treat you. It was that same mindset that led to my dog man account. And to this day, I still haven't changed what I do. You see, my wife started working for a pharmacy, Walgreens, in Monroe, Louisiana. This particular pharmacy happens to be located right next to a patch of wood. And because she was a new pharmacist, she got the bad hours, the hours that nobody wanted to work. It's a 24-hour store. The pharmacy closed at 10.30. So she was working from 2 to 10 p.m. No problem for me whatsoever. I work from home, so I take her to work, come back out at 10 and pick her up. That's where Dog Man comes in. This particular Saturday night, I'm sitting out there at 10 p.m. And it's taking her a hell of a lot longer than normal to close out the pharmacy. I got my car backed into a parking spot. Behind me is nothing but woods. In front of me is the side of the store and I'm fiddling and playing around on my cell phone as I always do. While I'm sitting there, my car shakes ever so slightly. You know how it is when you sit in your car in a garbage truck or 18 wheeler rolls by, it shakes the ground slightly. I feel the ground shake slightly just like that. So now I'm looking around for the garbage truck or the 18 wheeler riding up the road and I don't see anything. Put my head back down, go back to looking at my phone. Five minutes later, it shakes again. So now I'm sitting here thinking to myself, you know, this is Louisiana. We don't have earthquakes, but I know my car is shaking. Five more minutes pass, and my wife decides that she's going to FaceTime me and talk to me and let me know that she's on. So now I'm sitting up here to have my arm rested on the armrest, have the cell phone up in the air, and I'm looking at it, talking to her when I say, babe, it's getting late. You need to come up out of that store. True to fit form and fashion, my wife is taking her time, running her mouth, when she says, babe, Who's that in the back seat? Scares me a little bit. I look over my shoulder and nobody's back in the back seat. That's when she says, well, I could have swore I saw some eyes behind you. So now I'm paranoid. kicks in. I hang up the phone with her. And I look over my shoulder, right? But I don't see anything. Five more minutes pass. I put down my cell phone and now I'm more conscious of what's going on in my surroundings. I'm looking through my mirrors, looking through my rear view mirror. And that's when I see what looks like these eyes in the woods behind me. But you know how it is when you're looking through the mirror at night in the dark, your mind can play tricks on you. So I quickly open the driver's side door, step out, and look behind me. And sure enough, there's these giant golden yellow eyes in the trees. And they're just staring directly at me. Scare me so much, I hop in the car, drive around to the front side of the store, and park in the handicap spot. Now, get this. A few weeks later, I'm on Facebook trying to figure out what these eyes are. And I see this picture that someone has of Dogman. And it's the exact same eyes that I saw in those woods. Listen. The concept of a wolf that walks on its hind legs was and is still foreign to me. Even though I have spent countless hours of my life in the woods, I would have never imagined that such a thing existed or was possible. However, since seeing this creature, my perspective has changed, not so much on hunting and going into the woods, that is too much a part of my way of life, but on what is and isn't possible, if you catch what I mean. My mind no longer just accepts what people say is truth. In a way, my encounter has been a great eye-opener for me. Picture this. It was a warm, sunny day, 84 degrees. I had just parked the truck and was preparing to walk into the woods when I see another hunter, Evan, coming out of the woods. He has this crazy look on his face and he says, Jimmy, it's not a good day to be in the woods. I've been here since 5 a.m., went to take a deer, 
hit it and track the damn thing and when i found it let's just say something else had got there before me and it wasn't normal i say something else what are you talking about evan he replies listen just trust me stay out of the woods today besides you done got out here late anyway he was right i should have been here hours ago as he put his rifle in the back seat of his truck hopped in and pulled off i stood there thinking my mind wandered off started to replay the events of two days ago an issue at work i'm a distribution manager for a subsidiary of a major beer company and things have been extremely stressful around the office sales have been down and my boss doesn't seem to understand it's not my job to concern myself with marketing or branding or inner office politics it's my job to make sure our logistics are in order and that clients are happy with the service they get from this organization i'm not a cog in the machine i'm the gps system that makes sure that money makes it back to the organization so when she had this staff meeting and went into all this crazy nonsense i excused myself because it had zero to do with logistics and frankly it was an emotional tirade about the state of the beer industry and i just didn't agree with shit coming out of her mouth so i left went back to my office and got on the phone making sure things were taken care of 30 miles later she comes in talking about how she felt disrespected by me leaving the meeting and how if she was a man i would not have done that to her just crazy shit and she sees me on the phone with the client so i asked the client to call back and then i go off on her listen amanda first of all there were women who held your position for 10 years prior to you getting here her name was elizabeth i walked out of every meeting she had and you know what she never once stepped foot in my office talking about her fucking feelings want to know why because liz knew that if product does not get to its destination on time then she looks bad very bad you know what else elizabeth grew up with three brothers could shoot a gun drink me and you under the table and she didn't give a flying fuck about feelings she only wanted results so please don't come in here with that feminist bullshit about you being disrespected on the job i get paid to move stuff around i'm the best in this state at it and frankly i don't have time to sit and listen to a bunch of bitching and moaning about the marketplace and the consumers that keep the lights on she stood there with her mouth dropped wide open you could tell that over the span of her entire life no one had just told her like it was speechless is the word that came out of her mouth and she doubled down on her woe is me routine so i picked up the phone and called the client back and got back to work as she stood there rambling about a bunch of feelings for three men then stomped out 10 minutes later her boss Jules calls me Jules makes 1.8 million dollars a year he says hey buddy now you know things are changing the old school balls of steel iron tongue days are over these kids can't handle that harsh truth you got this woman calling me in tears he laughs and says the craziest part is she knows you're right but she feels like i cut him off and say Jules we got three drivers that are out sick also we got 600k profit on the road i've been busting my ass i just can't do it with her well guess what i didn't have a choice hiring her and so you don't have a choice working with her smooth it over and get back to work but i want you to know i understand believe me i do have you ever found yourself reliving an event and your body is just on autopilot well that is what happened to me i was on autopilot completely checked out of reality i had gotten my rifle and started walking into the woods that is how consumed i was in my thoughts and when i finally came to checked out of the mind hotel dude i'm 70 yards in the woods and i'm like shit so i figure you are already out here let's just take a walk in the woods so i walk and my mind starts to go into the scenarios of how i need to handle this woman again i check completely out i'm not in the woods i'm in my office seeing myself have a conversation with her and smoothing it all over i'm playing out the right words to say to sound apologetic but not like i rolled over because she called julian well i can't tell you how long i had been walking before i noticed the blood on the leaves i wasn't paying attention but i noticed it dark maroon colored thick tacky now i'm back to reality and i'm like let's just see if what he said was true so i start to follow this blood trail and sure enough i find the spot where the deer bled out blood all over the place i find his boot prints 20 yards away but there is no deer but there is another blood trail so i follow it for 50 more yards over to this patch of trees and there is blood all over the ground under this tree i'm looking around like what the hell so the dead deer didn't just walk off but then it dawns on me look up fool and when i do well i see this smaller wolf looking creature looking down at me blood on its snout 
and it bares its teeth at me. I remember verbally saying, what the hell are you? And backing away from the tree. Now here is where it really gets scary. The further I back away, my eyes seem to start to see what I couldn't see when I was close up. There is a larger one like I described. Black, slender, long snout, head like a German shepherd. That is right there, no more than 20 feet from where I was standing. Scared the shit out of me. And this thing is looking at me. No expression. You know how a dog stares at you person, watching their every move, like it's waiting on you to make a move, then it will take care of business. So I did nothing but back away and keep my eyes on it until I was far enough away to turn and fast walk back to the truck. Reddit. What is the creepiest true story someone has ever told you? When I was about 11, some friends and I were having a slumber party, and we all snuck out of the house in the middle of the night and went to a park about half a block away. We had been there at least an hour or so when I thought I saw a large shadowy figure about 100 feet away, lurking in the shadows under some trees. We all turned to look and stared in the shadow's direction for about five minutes trying to make it out. Right about when we had decided we were seeing things, the figure started running at us at top speed. We jumped up and ran back to the house as fast as we could go and locked the door. We could hear someone moving around the outside of the house and then it began tapping on the windows. We couldn't wake anyone up since we would have had to admit we had snuck out. We spent the night huddled together in the middle of the living room, waiting to be murdered. Luckily, freaking interviews or any stories or any tv shows or monster quests i found out about dog man by seeing one with my own two eyes listen i'm a logger professional logger been in the business for 15 years worked with all kind of companies my most recent employer evergreen out of alaska logging is dangerous work but i love being outdoors and it pays extremely well now before i start i'm gonna tell you my encounter was real short but that doesn't take anything from it at all because what i saw was absolutely amazing it's a monday morning we're working on the side of this ridge i'm on the ground cutting on a tree when i hear this growling sound over the sound of my chainsaw and through my ear protection confused by the sound i turned bumblebee off if you're trying to figure out who bumblebee is that's the nickname that i gave to my chainsaw so now the chainsaw is turned off the ear protection is slid up over my ears where I can hear, and now I hear this scratching sound. Clearly, the scratching sound like something climbing the trees. Imagine me standing there, these trees literally towering above me, my eyes scanning the trees, when all of a sudden I lock eyes with what looks like a giant wolf. And when I tell you it looks like a wolf, the only way I can describe this is the white wolf from Underworld. That's exactly what it looked like but it's damn near 75 feet up in a tree hanging on looking down at me now listen to me i'm not an animal psychic i'm not a mind reader all i know is it looked pissed off maybe it was pissed because i was cutting on the trees and i was making too much noise but it looks at me and growls again and the impression the only impression i got was motherfucker you getting on my fucking nerves if you keep it up i'm finna come down there and I'm going to eat you. It looks me dead in my eyes. I'll never forget this for two reasons. Because it was broad daylight. And it was absolutely terrifying. And it stares at me for another 15 seconds. I'm frozen in place. Scared to move. Then it turns his head. And leaps from one tree to the next. Now. I want to make you understand how far this leap was. We're not talking about 5 feet. We're talking about 25-30 feet. From one tree to the next uphill going up the ridge then leaps again and leaps again 
and it's gone out of sight. So now I have a dilemma on my hands. This tree is halfway cut. I need to finish cutting it, but I'm scared. So I sit down, start having an early lunch, wait 45 minutes to turn Bumblebee back on, finish cutting that tree, then I carry my ass back down the ridge and move closer to some of my other co-workers. Now, understand, this is how afraid I was. Because the closer I am to my co-workers, the more dangerous it is. It increases the chance of a tree falling on me. But honestly, I'd rather dodge a falling tree than deal with that creature any day of the week. A hard head makes a soft ass. That's what my mama used to say to me when I was a boy. See, I played in the bayous of Southwest Louisiana. When I tell you I was fearless, absolutely fearless. Alligators in the water, didn't care. I would swing from a tree, land in the water 10 feet away, and then swim right back out. But my reckless attitude caught up with me one night because I wanted to go frogging. And my friends all chicken out on me, saying that the woodsmen were back in the bayous. See, they had heard this from the night fishermen. And for whatever reason, none of those fishermen were going out at night. But I'm 15 years old, invincible, so I get my uncle's flat boat and head out there. Now, if you've never been frogging before, let me explain to you how it works. You ride in a boat with a headlamp on, cut the engines, and paddle across the water, snatching frogs by hand out of the water and from the lily pads. It's about 9.30, and I'm snatching frogs right and left, when I hear this tree limb break, snap, then another one, snap, each sound coming from different sides of the bayou. Now I'm looking around both sides of the bayou, don't hear anything else, don't see anything else, but it feels different. It feels creepy all of a sudden, like someone is out there in the dark, laying their eyes on me. That's when you can hear another limb break, but this time it's combined with this whistling sound, like something flying through the air, then Bam! A tree limb half the size of my boat slams into the water. And when I say this is close, it's so close to me, the leaves from the branches of the tree actually hit the boat. Now, I got the engine started, turning the boat around, trying to get the hell out of there. And as my head and that headlamp is whipping around in a circle, I get a glimpse of three, count them, one, two, three woodsmen standing right on the edge of the water. Huge shoulders, no neck, black fur, gigantic pectoral muscles scared the shit out of me. Understand what was going on while I was distracted by that limb hitting the water. These other three were about to wade into the water behind me. Had I stayed there three to four minutes longer, they would have been able to swim up to me and I would have never seen them coming. Back home, I go inside and my mama can tell something is not right. I tell her what I saw and she says, son, everyone else is staying out of the bayous at night for a reason. I done told your whole headed ass, it's things out there worse than gators in them bayous. Angrily, my mother goes on to explain that had they gotten to me, not only would she had never seen me again, but they never would have found the boat either. And I'll just say it like this. After experiencing that and seeing those things with my own two eyes, it created a healthy attitude adjustment in me. I found myself having a deeper understanding of what the hell could actually go wrong in these bayous.
I've listened to a lot of dog man encounters and stories. Started by listening to the guy with the weird, creepy voice. And then I listen to every channel out there, but not as a fan. Frankly, I think it's weird how people obsess over these animals. I mean, you don't obsess over great white sharks or giant squids or freaking endangered turtles. But when it comes to dog man, people obsess over this animal. And that's what it is. Nothing more than an animal. How do I know? Because I've encountered it multiple times. And after figuring out exactly what it was up to, I found myself pissed off. It started last year during this COVID lockdown. For the first time in my life, I was laid off and found myself at home being Mr. Mom. And if that wasn't bad enough, my daughter was going through the change. So she was an emotional roller coaster. One minute she's happy, the next minute she's sad. And on top of that, they were homeschooling. So there was no way to escape the sheer madness. While I'm trying to wrap my mind around the situation of me being unemployed, not knowing when I'm going to get another job, and dealing with my highly emotional daughter, Dogman starts with his freaking bullshit. You see, we live in eastern Texas, not far from the lake. It's about 11 p.m. When my daughter comes frantically running into the living room, telling me that someone was watching her through the bedroom window while she was changing her clothes. And I pause here for a moment because I didn't take this too seriously. Number one, this is Texas. Number two, this is a small town in Texas. Number three, people know you don't do that kind of stuff because you will get shot. The nearest neighbor is a half a mile away. So naturally, I think my daughter is being a drama queen. But just to ease her nerves, I get the shotgun and head outside. Hell, the thing wasn't even loaded. I circle around the house. There's nothing there. Come back inside, comfort her, and we go to bed. Now the next day, I just so happened to be outside, mainly because I wanted to get a break from being locked down in the house. And I noticed these scratch marks were on each side of the window. Like someone was standing there looking through the window, but scratching along the side of the house at the same time. Standing there looking at this, I start to think to myself, maybe there actually is something to what my daughter was saying after all. So that day, I replaced the burnt out flood light bulbs that I had outside just to give the place some extra lighting. But 3 a.m. that morning, my wife and I are awakened to my daughter coming into our bedroom scared out of her mind saying something was outside of her window and growling so i grab my mossberg shotgun put on shoes and head outside only to discover that the floodlights that i had just replaced have been unscrewed taken out of the socket and laid on the ground now i need you to understand my floodlights are 12 feet up in the air i personally have to have a ladder to climb up there and replace them so now i'm starting to worry i head back inside get my flashlight come back out and i'm scanning the edge of the property line and that's when i first get a glimpse of it it's up in the tree 30 yards away and it looks like a freaking werewolf from tv gray and black fur pointy ears that are twitching huge yellow eyes with these gigantic black pupils let me tell you this sob is just looking at me like i wish you would point that shotgun at me now i don't know if you ever find yourself in a situation like this where you're facing down something that you're absolutely terrified of for me my mind began to focus and there was this clarity of thought i was able to see the moisture on its snout even though it was dark outside and i thought to myself you know what if you take a shot at this creature with this shotgun and it don't work there's no way you're going to be able to get into that house and protect you and your family so I turn around, run back inside, close, and lock the door. That night, my daughter spent the rest of that night in the bedroom with me and my wife. Now, as for me, while the two of them were sleeping, I was awake wrestling with this problem. My mind just going left, right, up, and down. What is it? Where did it come from? Why is it here? What can I do to protect them? And that's how I started to reach out to people. The very next day is when I started listening to shows, interviews, uh, stories trying to find someone I could reach out to and talk to about my problem. Now, the issue that I ran into was that everyone, I mean everyone, wanted me to do some type of interview. And I'm trying to explain to these people, listen to me, I have a problem I need to deal with. I don't want to talk about it. I need to be about it. This is a problem. What can you tell me to do to fix it? 
So after talking to about 15 people, I learned that it could possibly have been my daughter's menstrual cycle that triggered the activity and caused this creature to focus in on her in a room. And a few days later, I was given a chemical solution, something that you could mix together and spray around the property. So I gave it a try. And sure enough, no more dogman activity. Then the following month, when my daughter's cycle first started, I decided to test it. I didn't spray and we started to hear scratching and growling outside. The next morning, I sprayed nothing. Halfway through her cycle, it rains. Next thing you know, it's back, scratching and looking through the windows. Everything inside of me wanted to shoot this creature, but I had been warned that shooting it would only make things worse. So I sprayed again, and it left. Now, here's a couple of things I took away from my experience with Dogman. Number one, they're real. And the second thing is, they're clearly, clearly attracted to the hormones or the smells or whatever it is that comes off a young woman's menstrual cycle. The situation I find myself in is that I have to keep spraying the wood line around my property. And these ingredients that I'm buying aren't cheap, and I'm pretty sure they're on some kind of federal watch list. But honestly, I have no choice. I keep buying it on Amazon because I don't want that creature coming back to my property. And if, by some strange coincidence, the feds show up at my house and start asking me questions about am I building bombs or making explosives, I'm just going to tell them straight up. I'm glad you're here. I got a freaking werewolf on my property. If you want to help me with that, I'll be more than happy to stop ordering this stuff on Amazon. of that entire day which is crazy and freaking weird. It all starts at 8.30 a.m. I'm in bed and I hear what sounds like a truck coming down the road that leads to my property. I roll out of bed, still in my tidy whities look out the window of my trailer and see it's my cousin Gar. A few minutes later we're inside and he's telling me about this wild night that he had with his friends. They went out drinking, then a fight breaks out, bottles are thrown. You know, normal Friday night hillbilly bullshit going on. You could tell Garth and him had been into a little bit of a tussle. Black eye, bruised knuckles, scratches all on his face. And one of the most important things to understand about my cousin is this. He's one of those quiet, crazy types. You know the kind of person that's easily underestimated, doesn't talk too much, but at the same time, he's extremely violent. So we're sitting there for about another five, ten minutes of small talk, and he finally gets to the point of his visit. He wanted to borrow $120. You see, Garth didn't want to go home to his old lady after being out all night drinking and then come home broke. So he needed to borrow $120 to keep her off his ass. And right here's where things start to freaking break bad. I didn't have $100 cash on me. So I tell Garth, look, just hop in your truck, drive on up to the gas station. I use the ATM machine, get the cash. You drop me back off and you go home. Should have been simple enough, right? So we head outside, get in his truck, get to the gas station. I hop out, go to the ATM machine. He walks in the door behind me. Now keep in mind, Garth has absolutely no money. I beat him back to the truck and I'm sitting there waiting on him when he walks out of the door with a six pack of beer. Hops in, opens a beer and starts to quickly pull off and drive away. Picture this, we're right there where the parking lot meets the road. And I'm sitting there telling Garth, listen, you want my $120 to keep you from having problems with your old lady, but you got enough money to go in the store to buy beer? And as the word beer is coming out of my mouth, I hear gunfire. And next thing you know, the back window of his truck is exploding. Glass is flying everywhere. Garth hits the gas, makes a left turn, and starts to race down the road. Now, looking over my shoulder, the store owner is standing outside in the middle of the parking lot with a shotgun. 
And I need you to realize This is a small town In fact it's smaller than a small town Everybody knows each other And now so now we're in a truck arguing I'm like Garth what the hell is going on And it turns out this son of a bitch Has went into the store And stolen A six pack of beer Mind you I have $120 Cash in my hand That he could have used to buy the beer This crazy bastard Decides to steal the beer Listen, at this point in time, I done had enough. I tell him, Golf, drop me off at home, take the money, and get the hell away from me. Two hours later, here comes the sheriff knocking on my door. I get arrested, and I'm sitting there. They're questioning me about Golf's whereabouts. The sheriff tells me, look, we done been to Golf's house. We done been to all his friends' houses. We don't know where the hell he is. And if you don't want to tell us where he is, you're going to sit your behind right here until we find him. So there I am, sitting in the holding cell, pissed off for the next 24 hours while they run around looking for Garth. When I finally get out of that holding cell, I'm so pissed off, I head straight to Garth's house. His old lady tells me she don't know where the hell he is, and she's pissed off with him. I go to every last one of his friends' house. None of them know where the hell he is. Now I'm thinking to myself, go on home, sit down, relax, he's going to show up. And when he does show up, I'm going to beat the brakes off of him. Now, the next day I get up about 6.30, 6.45 in the morning. My plan is to head on out to the woods and check some of the traps that I set the day before yesterday. Now, when I finally get to the area where I normally go set my traps, guess whose truck I find parked right there in the woods? Thinking to myself, this son of a bitch has been hiding in these woods this entire time. And I know exactly where to find his ass. What's up ladies and gentlemen, it's your boy Dog Waters coming back at you with another story Now listen, if you're new to the Dog Waters channel, new to the Dog Waters family You may not know, but I have my own private website called imdogwaters.com This is one of the members only stories that you can find there You need to sign up to listen to the rest of the story It's only $4.99 a month, about the same price as a cup of Starbucks coffee Head on over and take a listen If not, there's some other stuff coming down the pipeline but for those of you who are already members and all the new members, head on over to imdogwaters.com. This update is going to be on the front page. And some of the stuff on the front page currently is getting ready to get archived under the tabs. If it's a Bigfoot story, it'll go on the Bigfoot. If it's a dog man, it'll go on the dog man. All those are about to get archived because more new content is coming out. Head on over to imdogwaters.com right now and take a listen. Imagine coming home after a 13 hour international flight from a business meeting where you had the highest expectations, but due to one of your team members, it was a colossal failure. If that's not bad enough, your boss, who's an anal retentive asshole, is holding your feet to the fire and placing the blame for the bad turnout of this meeting squarely on your shoulders. Oh, and I can't forget this bullshit while you're there your girlfriend tells you that she wants to see other people those were the circumstances surrounding my return to the united states and all i wanted to do was just get home sit on the sofa turn on the tv and drink a beer however after a two-hour commute in atlanta traffic i arrive at my house only to notice that something is terribly wrong see my house was built in a brand new subdivision surrounded by woods it sits on three and a half acres of land and the first thing I notice is my wooden fence is leaning hopping out of the car and walking around to that side nope it's not just leaning it's broken okay going into the fence where my three dogs should be there is blood everywhere looks like a crime scene blood splatter all on the fence my above ground pool is full of blood and fur but I don't see any of my dogs anywhere the wooden steps leading up to my little deck, which is next to the pool, are cracked and splintered. So now, 
I'm standing there looking at all this, including the blood splatter all on the side of my house, thinking, now this is some bullshit. Going into the house, everything is fine. So I head up the street to my neighbor's house. So I head up the street to my neighbor's house. Understand, this is my neighbor who I had paid $200 to feed and make sure my dogs had water and were okay while I was gone. And pause here in the story. I want you to remember, I'm fresh off the plane, tired, already in a bad mood. I'm trying to hold it all together. I knock on her door. He opens up and I'm like, so, did you see anything crazy going down at my house? Because my dogs are gone, the fence is down, and there's blood everywhere. Now get this, he replies to me saying, yes, I know what happened, a werewolf did it. Now remember, I already told you, I was tired and moody, I wasn't in the mood for no foolishness, so I'm like, come on dude, really? What's going on, what happened to my dogs? That's when he says it again. A werewolf did it and closes the front door. Then I go to my other neighbor. Understand, there's only three houses completely developed in the subdivision. I knock on her door. She looks at me through the window and doesn't even open the freaking door. So I go home, call the police. They come out, look around and tell me it looks like a wild animal attacked my dog. No fucking shit, man. But what kind of wild animal knocks down the fence and leaves a murder scene like this? I'm telling you, my backyard literally looked like something from the movie Silent Hill. The police officer says he's not sure what could have done it, but he suspects that it probably was a bear. Takes a report and tells me to be careful, then leaves. So now, after flying all freaking night long, I'm outside trying to clean this mess. Nothing could be done about the fence. I go ahead and pull the plug on a pool, draining the water. Take a bucket, add bleach, water, and soap and scrub the blood which is now drying off on the side of my house and my windows. Spray everything down because flies are now starting to swarm and that's when I find the ear to one of my Labrador retrievers. Listen to me when I tell you, at this point in time, I'm just tired and pissed off. So I head inside, take off my clothes and get into the bed, light a joint and doze off to sleep. The next morning, I head to work and get my ass handed to me by my boss. And when I tell you emotionally, I'm distraught and just freaking over everything, like I'm over everything. So I head home early, take a Xanax and fucking sit there on the sofa, contemplating my life, watching Netflix, eating comfort food until night falls. Get this, I head up to my bedroom, circling around the bed, glance out of the window only to see what looks like these eyes looking at my house from the woods. These huge eyes are reflecting this red color. And I'm like, nah, man, hell no. This couldn't possibly be something standing out there looking at me in the woods. But then the eyes blink, and I'm like, holy crap, this is real. So I head outside with my flashlight and shotgun. Now pause for a moment because I need you to understand something. I didn't know anything about Dog Man. As far as I'm concerned, werewolves were things of movies. So I circle around the front side of the house along the fence, shine a light into the woods, and nothing's there so I'm thinking to myself okay now you're fucking hallucinating you're stressed out I rationalize everything away in my head the only thing I could think of is maybe maybe just maybe like he said it's a bear out there we definitely have black bears in Georgia so I write it off go inside head to bed trying to put my mind to rest so I can get back to work however the next night I realized something absolutely terrible was out there in the woods way worse than any bear and my neighbor who I asked to watch my dog was the problem because about 9 p.m. that night I hear shooting not like handgun shooting but rifle shooting I grab my shotgun head out of the front door into my front yard and realize that the shooting is coming from his house and understand like I've explained to you before it's only the three houses back there so now I'm heading over to his house knocking on his front door his wife comes to the door hair all over the place robe on the woman looked like she just dodged the 18 wheeler on the freeway her eyes are wide open and she's like it's back it's back she literally pulls me into the house pushing me through the living room into the kitchen through the back door which leads to their raised patio and there he was on the edge of the patio shining a light and shooting into the trees 
Now looking into those trees, there's what I would describe as a wolfman jumping down from the tree. And that's when my neighbor lays it all on me, saying, that's what killed them dogs. He puts down his rifle, picks up two freaking grenades, pulls the pin on one, chucks it into the woods, pulls the pin on the other one. I'm like, oh shit, I'm expecting an explosion, shit flying all over the place. Instead, it's this loud, deafening bang sound. And while my ears were still ringing from the first bang, I hear another one. Hands over my ears, he's now pulling me back into the house. I can't hear shit he's saying. I'm confused. His wife is standing there, trembling. I'm reading his lips as he's mouthing, it won't be back for a while. Listen to me when I tell you, it took damn near a solid hour before I could even hear right. And that's when this man tells me the truth. That that creature showed up and he started shooting at it. And he decided to take my three dogs out into the woods with him looking for it. But he couldn't find it. Early that morning, he heard it at my house slaughtering and killing my dog so he went up the road to scare it off but by the time he got there the damage was already done his wife chimes into the conversation saying why in the hell did you shoot at it in the first place i told you not to shoot according to her she was the one who was in the kitchen and saw it walking on the back side of their fence its shoulders were above their eight foot wooden fence she tells him anything that fucking big you need to leave it alone unless it messes with you now the two of them are arguing he's saying it's my job to defend the house she's screaming and it dawns on me hold on hold on hold on hold on hold on you got my dogs killed got my fence broken caused all these problems because you think you some kind of fucking werewolf hunter so i tell them listen we're gonna have to do something about this shit i'm calling the police that's when they tell me they had already called the police so i tell them let's call animal control so we call the hotline a guy answers and i tell him the truth straight up my neighbor and i just finished shooting at a walking wolf and the man on the phone goes silent i mean silent long enough for me to have to say hello are you still there then the man says yes sir i'm here what's your address i tell him the address and then i ask him hey man what should we do he says did you hit it i'm like shit i don't know but what i do know is it was big it was so big i don't think you could really miss it that's what this man tells us the best advice he could give us is to stay in the house and lock the doors and don't leave the house until morning quite logically my question to him is like okay so is somebody coming or what's going on that's when he tells me someone will be there as soon as possible well as soon as possible turns out to be the next morning at 7 a.m because there's a knock at the door keep in mind i have not been back up the street to my house i spent the night in their house this man not dressed in any ranger outfit no police uniform nothing like that knocks on the door and says you called about a wild animal and i tell him listen this ain't no wild animal this is a fucking wolf that walks around jumps from tree to tree and lands on the ground and killed by fucking dogs that's when he asks us to escort him to the area so we walk him around the house to the back side of the fence and into the woods and this man tells us to go back inside while he takes a look listen the dude walked back there in the woods for like 30 minutes comes back to the front side of the house gets his cell phone out of his car and makes a call and then leaves no closure no goodbye no i found something didn't tell us shit just leaves now get this after he's gone we all realize that we asked him his name and he never even responded he just straight blew past the question so we didn't even know this man's name now i'm fucking over all this shit so i go home get dressed go to work late when i come back home that evening the road that leads to my house is blocked there's a guy standing there and he tells me that i can't go home that a hotel has been arranged for me i'm like nah nah fuck that i'm going home my man like i don't know what's going on but i need to go home that's when he pulls out a homeland security badge flashes his gun and says listen take this card call this number go to the hotel you can come home in the morning trust me this is better for you now so now i'm sitting in the car in front of him i dialed this number 
there is silence on the line for like five seconds what i mean by silence is the fucking phone doesn't ring it's just silent then this woman says mr lewis then this woman says mr lewis a hotel room has been arranged for you at the hilton suites gives me the address and says sorry for the inconvenience you can return home in the morning when i get to the hotel my neighbors whose house i had just spent the night in are sitting in the lobby along with the other neighbor who refused to open her door that's when i learned that the man returned telling all of them that they needed to leave so all of us sit there discussing this shit for the next few hours and finally come to the conclusion that there's nothing we can do but we make an agreement that we're all going back home at the same time 7 a.m in the morning so get this the next morning we leave all at the same time our little caravan rolling down the road when we get there the roadway to our house is open pulling up to my house the fence has been fixed going into my yard the pool has been replaced there is even new sod down in my backyard and get this my house has been fucking pressure washed now walking up the street to my neighbor's house the trees on the back side of his property have been cut and cleared and get this after that one night there was nothing not a fucking sound it was almost like every critter creature animal in the woods around that subdivision was freaking gone listen my neighbors and i have discussed this extensively we really have and we all have come to the same conclusion that whatever that thing was dog man werewolf whatever you want to call it i don't care whatever it was it belonged to the government and they came and they got it and that's why they repaired my house that's why they cleared the trees that's why they did everything that they did was because it was theirs <laughs> Simple Jack, yeah, you went all out on that one, huh? You did. I really swung for the fences. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, it was an intense experience. You know, I just, I just did the work. Watched a lot of retarded people. Spent time with them, observed them. Watched all the retarded stuff they did. But you know, there were times when I was doing Jack that I actually felt retarded, like really retarded. Dang. In a weird way, I had to sort of just free myself up to believe that it was okay to be stupid or dumb. To be a moron. Yeah. To be moronical. Exactly. To be a moron. An imbecile. Yeah. Not the dumbest motherfucker that ever lived. Stupid ass Jack. By the end of the whole thing, I was like, wait a minute, you know? I flushed so much out, how am I gonna jumpstart it up again? It's just like... Yeah. Yeah, right? You was farting in bathtubs, laughing your ass off. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, it was just really quite a, it was crazy. It's that working with Mercury. You're serious? You don't know. <laughs> Everybody knows you never go full retard. What do you mean? You went full retard, man. Never go full retard. My journey down the path to dog man discovery started with listening to interviews. My favorite interview is Fight with the Dog Man. I was a teenager when I first heard this and been fascinated ever since to listening to everyone's dog man encounters across YouTube. So I started doing my own research. And on my 21st birthday, I asked my mom to finance an expedition to this graveyard. Some coordinates I found on Facebook. We sat down and talked about my obsession. My mother, who's a veterinarian, said that these creatures couldn't possibly exist. But nonetheless, she sponsored my trip. Now listen, this was my plan. I wanted to get footage, start my own YouTube channel, and get my mom to review and comment on the footage as a veterinarian. Hell, I thought it was a neat idea. Nobody was doing it, so I run with it. Head down to Alabama. I'm there three days and find nothing. The first day, I'm out there walking around, looking for evidence, but I don't see anything. I come back that night, and yes, it's freaky and creepy in the cemetery, but there's nothing going on. The next night, I'm out there about 9.30 p.m. Now, I didn't know they had security at this graveyard, but oh, I'm running to the security guard. Old black man, and he is pissed off. He says, you white motherfuckers always coming out here 
fucking around robbing these graves. Get your ass the fuck out of here before I shoot you. Imagine me standing there with my hands up, flashlight shining in my eyes, saying, listen, sir, I'm not here to rob any graves. I just came out here to do some paranormal investigations. But clearly, he had had some very bad encounters in his graveyard because he says, I don't give a shit what you out here looking for. Your ass needs to leave right fucking now. He lowers the light out of my eyes and I get a good look at him. Six foot four, bald headed with these moles on his face. He's now shining the light in the direction of the exit. So slowly I start walking that way. And he says, I don't even understand what the hell you think you're going to find out here. Why in the hell would you bring your ass out here? I stop, turn and say again, sir, I'm not out here to bother anybody's graves. I'm just out here to do some paranormal investigation. You know, ghost hunting, werewolves, monsters, Bigfoots. This look comes over his face as he scans my body up and down. And I guess he came to the realization that I wasn't a threat. So I show him the video footage I have. Me just walking around the graveyard, not touching anything, not doing anything. That's when he literally grabs me by my arm and begins to drag my body over by this grave and points to it and says, so you've been out here all night long recording and filming and you didn't see who or what dug this grave up right here. I tell him, sir, yes, I've been out here wandering around, but I wasn't messing with no graves. And I didn't see anybody else out here messing with any graves. Listen, I came down here to get evidence of dog, man. So I wasn't going to let this man deter me. So now I'm trying to talk him into seeing things my way. And so I start questioning him. Well, sir, have you ever seen anything weird out here or anything crazy? And he says, yeah, I've seen some weird, crazy things out here. Well, that's all I'm looking for. I'm not here to bother anything. I'm not here to bother anybody. Quite frankly, if I see what I'm looking for, I'm probably going to turn around and run. Is there any kind of way you can work with me? I'm here for another night. I just need to come back tomorrow night and do some investigations. Listen, if I don't see anything, then I'm out of here. But if I do and I catch it on camera, cool. But I promise you I won't do anything. I will even come back out here and keep you company as you work just so I can do my investigation. He looks me up and down and says, I tell you what, son, it's definitely kind of creepy out here and lonely at night. Meet me out here tomorrow at 7 o'clock, and we'll see what we can do. Listen to me. I'm fucking excited. Now I'm going to have access to the graveyard where there's been documented dogman activity, and I'm not going to get arrested by the sheriff, and this guy ain't going to shoot me in my ass. So I'm floating on cloud nine. The following evening, I get there at 6.30. He pulls up at 7 o'clock, opens the door to his truck, and says, get in. Now I'm thinking we're going to be in this graveyard, but no, 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 no. Turns out, He's responsible for five graveyards in the area. So we end up riding around from one graveyard to the next to the next. Now, we're on our way from the third to the fourth graveyard, working our way back to the original one where we met at when he says, you know, I'm not sure exactly what it is you're looking for out here, but maybe I could just tell you a little bit about it. So I start questioning him. Well, can you tell me about some of the creepy and weird things you've seen out here? He says, yeah. That's why I was so pissed off at you. Just the other night, I was out here riding around doing my rounds, and I pull up in a graveyard, and I see two kids laying on top of a grave. Girl is on top of this boy riding him cowgirl style. That's why I say you white motherfuckers are nasty. I don't even know why you would be out here doing something like that. Anyway, I get out of my truck, walk up on them with the flashlights, shine a light on them, because I'm pissed. They out here with that black magic, sex magic, you know, when they make love on them graves like that, it's called soul sucking. So they out there making love on the grave, soul sucking. I shine a light on them. And when they look at me, both of them got jet black eyes. When I tell you jet black eyes, I mean complete total black eyes. Scared the shit out of me. I pull my weapon, they hop up and take off running. Listen, this awkward silence kind of takes over as I'm trying to figure out what the hell he's talking about. And you can tell he was reliving seeing that exact thing. That silence is broken by him saying, well, what exactly is it you think you're going to find out here? Now, this is when things take a turn for the worse, because I tell him, well, I'm out here looking for dog man. He says, dog man, I ain't never heard of no dog man. I tell him, you know, upright walking wolves, werewolves. I think here in the South, y'all call it the Rougarou. Lord Jesus, why did I say that? 
because he pulls over to the side of the road, slamming the brake, squares his body up in the truck with me and says, why in the fuck would you come here looking for the Rougarou? You see, this is the shit that I'm talking about. You're going to come out here and you're going to mess with them things. I already got enough problems with them digging up graves and taking bones. But no, you want to come out here and you're going to rile them things up. And then you're going to go back home to where the hell you came from. And guess who's going to have to deal with them while they pissed off me? I'm going to have to deal with the pissed off Rougarou because you out here chasing and trying to take pictures of it. Nope, not having it. This what the fuck you going to do. You finna get your little narrow ass back in your vehicle and carry it back to wherever the hell you came from, boy. You understand me? Now, at first he's screaming at me and that's scary enough, but then he starts to whisper and he says, See, if you come around here one more time and get them Rougarous upset and they get to chasing me, slashing my tires, trying to get me, and I see you, I'm gonna kill you. Sure enough, I'm going to pull my gun and I'm going to kill you. Now, understand, the whole time he's talking to me, he's got his hand on his gun. And I'm getting the impression that this man is not playing whatsoever. Then he whips a U-turn, starts flying down the road, takes me back to the original cemetery where we were, and lets me out right by my vehicle, saying, Nah, son, if you bring your ass back, I'm going to shoot you. If I don't shoot you, and I can't get to you, I'm going to call the sheriff and they're going to arrest your ass. So I'm telling you, son, don't bring your ass back over here. Ain't nothing over here for you. All you're going to do is rile that Rougarou up and it's going to lose his mind. And you're not prepared for what's going to happen when that Rougarou loses his mind. So what I want you to do is get the hell on. I want you to get the hell on right now. Listen to me when I tell you this. I didn't have a choice but to leave. Looking in this man's eyes, he was clearly capable of following through with his threat and shooting me. And I think he wanted to do it right then and there. So I got back in my vehicle and I drove home. Didn't get one shred of evidence of a dog man whatsoever. But I did learn a lesson. It's a little bit more complicated than just going to a spot looking for dog man. There's these other variables involved in the equation. Like him. The Dark Waters channel is for entertainment purposes only. Although information in these stories can be traced back to relevant and true sources, Dark Waters strongly discourages its viewers, listeners, and subscribers from visiting the site of incidents and encounters discussed or revealed on the show. In other words, we will not be held responsible if you are attacked by a dogman, molested by a Bigfoot, bitten by vampires, chased by chupacabras, abducted by aliens, accosted by the men in black, investigated or arrested by the local law enforcement, CIA, FBI, NSA, EPA, BLM, or another alphabet group, whether on U.S. soil or abroad. Thank you for tuning in, and enjoy the show. America is home to a centuries-old legend. A hominid creature, known by many names, Sasquatch, Yeti, the Woodsman, and the most popular name of all, Bigfoot. Tonight on the Dark Waters Channel, we travel into the world of Bigfoot, where Bigfoot truth seekers combine forces to share stories and encounters from around the world. Tonight we proudly present the Bigfoot Bonanza. My farm is located just south of Shreveport, Louisiana, and I inherited it from my grandfather five years ago. Since that day, I've grown the business to another level. One of the only commercial farms here that does more business than mine is Mahaffrey. And Mahaffrey is one of the powerhouses of Louisiana farm to food industry. Here on my farm, I grow everything. Pasture-raised chickens, pork, beef, vegetables. I employ 32 people and have over $4 million worth of equipment here. Needless to say, I was very nervous when all this activity began to happen. It started about three months ago when Jordan, my guy who manages everything to do with poultry, came into the house. He had this weird look on his face. Jordan is responsible for making sure everything goes well with my chickens, that the eggs are collected on time, that they get out and get exercise. He told me that as he let the chickens out for the day, 
he was walking around the fence line and noticed something strange. He said that he saw these tracks that looked canine, and that the tracks circled the perimeter of the fence, and then they're back into the woods. According to Jordan, these tracks were huge, and whatever it was, it must have been a big dog on all fours. Standing in front of me, Jordan was clearly disturbed by these prints, and insisted that I come take a look. So we drove out to the spot near the chickens and walked the fence line. Initially, when he said big dog prints, I thought he was just talking about a big dog. But these prints were massive. This was like nothing I'd ever seen around my farm before. I now understood why he was so worried, but there was absolutely nothing I could do. And being crazy enough to try and track an animal that size into the woods, he's just looking for trouble. A few days passed, and Jordan forgot about the prints, and I turned my attention to this upcoming inspection that I had with the Department of Agriculture. You see, six months ago when I was going through my divorce, I fell way behind on paperwork, and luckily, I was able to talk to the inspector into giving me a re-inspection, allowing me more time to submit the proper documents. It was 3 a.m. in the morning, the day of the inspection. And I had been working all night to get the reports finished and the paperwork filled out for the DOA when I heard a ruckus out at the cow pasture. See, my farm is wired for video and sound. So I went to my little video monitoring room to see what the deal was. What I saw on that camera, I couldn't believe. My cattle were all herded up against the western fence line. 300 of them, huddled together, in fear. And at the eastern side of the fence was some kind of creature his eyes glistened this green color on the camera, and it was huge. This thing was moving in and out of the view of the camera as it would back up to the wood line and then charge the fence. Based on this thing's size, it could have easily jumped over the fence or even ran through it. But it was like it wanted to scare the cattle. It was toying with them. Trying to figure out what to do, I decided to grab my cell phone and I opened up the video app that allowed me to monitor the cameras mobily. Then I went to my closet and I grabbed my shotgun. This creature, whatever it was, was too big to confront. But I figured if I just went out back and fired a few rounds into the air, it would leave like any other animal would. Boy, was I wrong. I stepped out of the back door with my shotgun, pointed into the air, and fired while I was looking at the camera. This thing stopped, turned its head in the direction of the gunfire, then it starts heading in my direction. Only then did I get a full look at this thing as it jumped the fence and ran through the cow pasture coming straight towards me. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie Underworld when those creatures are running on all fours that's exactly what I saw it was unreal I rushed back into the house locking the door and headed into my office it was now 3.35 a.m. and I would only be alone for another 10 minutes the morning crew of workers including Jordan would be pulling up any minute as I sat there with my shotgun I watched this thing circle the house sniffing and somehow it pinpointed the very room that I was in that's when I heard the scratching and banging on the walls I can't express to you how terrified I was. For the next nine minutes, all I thought about was that I was going to die. This creature was going to break down the wall and eat me. I looked at the camera as this thing on all fours kept banging against the wall with his shoulders over and over and over again. And the scratching. Oh my God, it was something out of a nightmare. Looking back on it all now, this thing had to be trying to intimidate or scare me. Because it didn't make sense. If it wanted into the house, it could have just ran through one of the glass doors or broken down the front door. It seemed like it was forever, but finally my watch beat 345, and I could hear the trucks begin to pull in the parking lot out front. Jordan and his crew were always the first there in the morning. I watched on camera as this thing looked directly at the light of the trucks. Then with speed and agility, unlike anything I'd ever seen before, it ran off towards the back of the farm. Jordan and his men were walking around the side of the house when I came out the back door. My face must have given it all away because Jordan's first question was, Did you see it? All I could do was nod my head yes. That's when he told me about the dog man and how it had been seen all over the United States, especially in Louisiana. Jordan had me listen to several shows and that's how I found you. We've been using the powder that your guys recommended and have gone as far as to maintain a perimeter around our farm with it. I haven't seen this creature since we made the changes. However, I'm starting to hear rumors that other farms in the area are having similar problems, except for they've lost chickens and cattle. I'm even hearing about more than one of these things appearing at the same time. I hope this is my one and only time ever seeing Dogman. I 
I'll never forget my first time seeing a dog, man. To Black Southern Baptist, and I can never forget that day. It was at a revival service. Back in those days, Christian revivals were held outdoors, inside tents. And to paint a clear picture for you, if you can imagine being outside on a hot summer day with a huge white tent set up, rows and rows and rows of chairs, a makeshift stage, and people were heavy in the worship. This is my first time going to a revival, although I've been dragged in and out of church every Sunday my entire life. I thought it was interesting. The way people worshiped out of the church was completely different than the way they worshiped in church. It was much more intense. And I can never forget the sounds of that day. The revival had started at about 3 o'clock and had gone on for hours. And right as the sun began to set and the pastor started doing the altar call to save souls, something weird started to happen. From my position on the right hand side of the back row, I started to hear the strange sound coming from the woods, but I wasn't sure what it was. Amen. You could hear it faintly, just above the sound of the singing. Then as the singing and the clapping stopped, I could hear it clearer. Something was growling, and growling loudly. Initially, I thought I was hearing things until my grandmother started looking in the same direction as the sound. Then others in the congregation began to look that way too. And out from the wood line stepped something I had never seen before and hoped to never see again. This thing was massive, nine feet tall, with the huge head of a wolf. Its fur was black, jet black, and its upper body had more muscles than anything I had ever seen. It just stood there, showing his teeth and growling. The people in the congregation finally caught on to it and began to run. The pastor grabbed his Bible and began to pray, repeatedly saying, Get ye behind me, Satan. Get ye behind me, Satan. Until one of the deacons grabbed him by his collar and pulled him, yanking him off the stage. Everyone ran back to their cars and fled the area. I never knew exactly what that was that I saw until I heard you on Coast to Coast AM talking about the dog man. I'm sure that not only did I see a dog man, but 200 other people. When I was told by my friend that you were not critical of him when he told you about his dog man experience, at first I was skeptical. However after speaking with you I realized that you are the real deal. This encounter I'm going to share with you can be verified by my 19 year old son. Both my son and I are what you call Cajuns here in Louisiana. I spend the majority of my free time hunting and fishing in the bayous of southeast Louisiana. Per our agreement I am not disclosing exactly where this happened, I still have to live and work in this area, but I will do my best to paint a clear picture of the surrounding. It was early August and my son and I had spent the entire day fishing, I have an 18-foot Aluma craft boat with a Yamaha 40 motor. On the front I mounted a trolling motor, it is a Minnesota Kota 45-pound thrust battery powered setup. The max speed on this motor with two people on my boat is 12 miles per hour through calm waters. It was just turning dark when our encounter began. The Yamaha 40 motor on my boat was noticed also my son and I always tried to get out of the bayous before dark. As expected the Yamaha 40 was stalling and slow to crank up. As I pressed the ignition she wouldn't turn over. We didn't want to flood the engine so instead we began using the trolling motor to travel along the bayou to head home. It was no big deal we had done this many of times. It did mean that a 20 minute drive through the bayou would now take an hour. We were rounding a bin near the levee when everything went quiet. My son brought it to my attention. Papa listen. He said. Everything is so quiet. There was not a sound, no birds, crickets, no fish splashing, the only sound was the steady hum of the trolling motor. In order for you to understand what happens next I have to explain the area we were in. The levee is for storm surge protection, it's 12 to 15 feet tall in spots, along this waterway. 
The levee is on our left hand side, on our right hand side is primary forested wetland. The bayou. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Dark Waters, with another episode of Out of Left Field. And for those of you who are new, who are new to the Dark Waters channel, um, to explain to you what Out of Left Field is, it is a storytelling format that I came up with that's real free-flowing. It's very free-flowing. It's, um, it's not like the highly produced stories with the music and the sound well it has music but it doesn't have all the background sounds and everything else it's essentially the same thing as when i do a radio interview the same concept it's just me telling you guys a story not live but as close to live as possible right so it's one of the fan favorites hadn't done a, one of them in a while and just so you'll know the reason why i end up uh, getting doing these is because there's time periods where i go through I mean, like, call after call after call after call from people. And if you don't know the way the stories, there's two ways stories appear on Adult Waters channel. Um, one is these are stories that my friends tell me that are very close friends of mine. And then there's other stories that are kind of submitted verbally to me through members of the Adult Waters family where they call my phone number and I talk to them over time. So there's three ways. And then the third way is that some of the stories from Phantoms and Monsters blog, which we have a monetization agreement with, are put on the channels as well. So some of them are super high format, like um, Bigfoot Expedition in Alaska, Killing Bigfoot, or Siege of Lock and Ranch. Or then it kind of dumbs down to, you know, three scary stories, four scary stories, blah, 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 blah. And then you get out of left field, which is this. So out of left field, that's an explanation for you. Boom. So I've been talking to, um, you guys got to forgive me for the kind of heavy breathing, but it's kind of stuff. I'm stuffy. I've been talking to a number of people and I had a couple of encounters that I think are just insane. Right. As you guys know, I do not like dealing with the demon possession, whole demonic thing. But I did have the occasion of running into a young lady who I grew up with. She was older than me. She's definitely older than me. I think she's four years older than me, maybe five years older. Than me. But her brother and I used to be childhood friends. So I ran into her at Mardi Gras. Just, I mean, most random thing on the planet. And I almost didn't recognize her because she had so many tattoos and four or five children with her. And she told me that her brother was in federal penitentiary so she says hey give me your phone number my brother would like to speak to you and i'm like all right cool now i'm not giving you the guy's name i give you one of his aliases his alias is magnolia red or one of his aliases magnolia red so i give her my number come home a couple of days pass my phone rings i get a call from a correctional facility if you ever had a phone call from correctional facility you know that call is a collect call um and so i take the call and it's this guy that, man, you know, I literally grew up with. I mean, we played football and a lot across the street from my house. And um, and so we, we're we just talking, you know. And he's like, man, you know what you've been up to, how you been. And I'm telling him that I'm sorry that, you know, you're in this situation. I didn't even know that he had gone up. I didn't ask him what he went to prison for because I kind of got an idea already because based on how he was as a kid, I can imagine to, you know, some of the things he did. But anyway, moving forward. Phone call one is just kind of us just chopping it up. Um, at the end of that call, he says, hey, man, you know, 
do you mind if I call you because it gets a little lonely in here? Do you mind if I write? Would you write back or would you send me a letter? Boom, boom, boom. Um, can you send me some magazines? You know, just he trying to get stuff. And I, I'm cool with it, you know, because I mean, he's not the only friend I have in there. So he calls back two days later. And he's really interested in what I'm doing. So I tell him about, you know, the Dark Waters channel. I tell him about my real estate investing. I tell him about, you know, a couple of the business ventures that I have going on. And he's like, man, you know, I'm real proud of you. You always been real smart. The whole shebang. And he says, well, I got a story for you. I'm like, well, what kind of story you got for me? Now, I didn't know that Red's grandmother was into voodoo. I didn't know that at all. I mean, I I met Red's grandmother a number of times, a number of times when we were kids, but I didn't know his grandmother was into voodoo. And so Red goes on to tell me that um, he moved out of our old neighborhood uh, a couple of years after I moved out. And he moved to another neighborhood uptown. Now, this was his choice because he could have stayed where he was, but he wanted to he wanted to move out and go with his half brother where his half brother lived. And his half brother lived in a very, very rough neighborhood. He moves uptown by his half brother and his half brother is a dope dealer, not just a regular dope dealer. You know, like there's dope deals. There's guys who sell, you know, um, there's guys who sell weed and then they might sell you an ounce of weed. You know what I'm saying? And then there's guys who's got weed, but they got like garbage cans full of fucking weed at their house. Right. You know, like garbage cans, like the kind that you pick up leaves with, you know, there's guys who sell heroin. Then there's those guys that have kilos of drugs. Well, these are the type drug dealers that, and over time he gets into these battles with people. His half brother gets killed. And then four of the other people that he's working with get murdered. So basically, his enemies are closing in on him. And Red makes a deal with the demon. Which, now guys, let me pause right here. Because when he's telling me this on the phone, I'm like, why are you telling me this? Like, why why would you even tell me this? He's like, well, man, you doing stories. I'm going to tell you, you know, I'm going to tell you my story. He makes this deal with a demon. I will not repeat the name. Y'all know I don't play that foolishness. But he makes this deal with this demon. And his deal was that he would be able to run the drug trade in exchange for his soul. While I'm talking to this dude, I'm like, dog, like, because, you know, I, I guess he didn't expect me to believe him, guys. I guess he didn't expect me to, to you know, just be like, yeah. I guess he expected me to be like, nah, bro, you crazy and hang up the phone. But my first reaction is, what's the purpose of that, like, revenge and money? When somebody say, I run this, I'm the shot caller. So in his mind, he was going to be the shot caller. He the one calling shots, taking people out and making sure that he ran the streets. Well, he got what he wanted. He got what he wanted for five years. He was on top. Then on the fifth year, the fifth month, the fifth day, it's exactly how he describes it. He was sitting in a car outside one of the little corner stores, and he had just opened what we call a Hawaiian punch. I don't know if y'all ever had a Hawaiian punch. He had just opened a Hawaiian punch and started drinking. And a 13-year-old little boy that he knew walked up to him and shot him. He said the kid was scared. The kid didn't hit him in the chest. The kid hit him in the stomach. Like on the right side of his body, towards his stomach, towards his liver, and hit him in the leg. And he pulled off. So he drove off. He was trying to drive himself to the hospital, passed out. Bam. He hits a telephone pole. Of course, emergency services come out. Police ambulances because he's been shot and all the rest of this stuff. He's, he got all kind of shit on him that he don't need. He got drugs in the car. He got unregistered firearms in the car. Goes into the hospital. Recovers from being shot. Ends up going to trial and going to prison. What he told me was this. He said, yeah, man, I made that deal and I got what I wanted for a limited time. But I never thought that I would spend the rest of my life in prison. And, and, and it was heartbreaking for me. It really was. It was heartbreaking for me because I've said so many times that, you know, a lot of stuff that goes on in this world is spiritual warfare. And unfortunately, to have somebody that, I, I mean, I, dude, I mean, I know this brother like I crazy. But needless to say, Red, I did your story. I don't even know if you're going to be able a chance to hear this. Uh, there's no way for me to kind of reenact your story. But, Red, I did your story, man, and, and hopefully you, you'll hear it. All right. The next person I talked to, and I'm only really doing two of these. The next person that I talked to, this lady, 
when we first started talking, it took a little while for me to, to start trusting her because she started off telling her story and she was excited about telling her story. And when it comes to this particular topic, which is dog, man, I find that when people are excited to tell me the story, you're normally a little bit off. Right. But it turns out that's just how she is. She's just an excitable person. Um, and considering her circumstances, I think it's amazing the type of personality that this woman has because uh, this woman's blind, right? And like I said, when I first started talking to her, you know, when you first start talking to a person on the phone, you have no freaking clue they're blind. The fact that she's blind comes out when she's telling me the story. Now, a dull man encounter happens her when she's out with her son uh, and they're on a walking trail in Arkansas. Early in the morning, she's walking behind her son and she's 20 yards behind him. He always keeps her in, in eye shot when he can look over his shoulder and see her. And he'll get ahead of her and slow down, let her catch up with him. He wants to make her feel independent. I've spoken to her and her son. 7.30 in the morning, the sun is out. It's not foggy. To describe this trail that they're walking on, as you're walking around, you kind of circle around the park. And then on the outskirts of the park, there's just these woods. So, you know, while you're walking around the park area, pretty wide open. But when you get on, on the outskirts of the park, which when you're taking your larger loop around, you kind of go into the woods and then you come back out and you come back out on the other side of the park. So they walk around the park and then they get to the part of the trail where they're going into like the little wooded area. But it's not like woods like some spooky, sleepy, hollow type TV show woods. It's just walking through some freaking woods. But it's not. It's a trail that a lot of people use. As they're walking, he looks back and he notices that she stopped like dead in her tracks. And so he's standing there looking at her and he's saying to himself, well, you know, what is she doing? She normally just keeps walking and keeps up with him. From her perspective, at the same time this was happening, she told me that she was starting to hear this low rumbling growl from her left, which is the pretty much the wood line that leads into the woods. They're on a trail to the wood. On the left side, it leads deeper into the woods. On the right side, there's like trees. But if you get on the other side of those trees, you're right back in the park. Well, from her left side, She's hearing this low growling sound. And she's thinking it's a dog, right? She's like, oh my God, I got, you know, I got a dog up on me right now. In her mind, the best thing to do was stop, try and get a sense of where it was from the sound. And she knew that if she stopped, her son would eventually learn, turn around and see that she stopped. The growling was low, but it wasn't strong. It sounded like a regular dog. So she starts walking again. She's like, okay, well. At least if it moves, I'll know what I could do. So she starts walking. She hears whatever it is moving along the tree line, paralleling her. And then she hears a growl again. But this time, it's strong. I mean, it's loud. Simultaneously, her son, who's ahead of her, hears the growl. So he starts running towards her because he's like, I don't know what the hell this is. From the son's description, he sees this gigantic head freaking dog head is what he said he said it looked like a big german shepherd head poke out from behind a tree to where you could see it on a trail and the head was uh, looking at his mother now from her perspective she heard the growl she said i got this sense and she's like i, I couldn't see what it was but i felt it she's like i felt its intentions and i felt like whatever this thing was it was evil and it was right there in front of me. So you got this head sticking out of the trees. And it's in between her and her son. Her son is jogging back towards her. And he's no more 20, 30 yards away. He sees this head. And he starts screaming at it. Hey, ah, ah, like screaming, trying to get it, get his attention. Because he's thinking whatever this big dog is, is about to freaking eat his mom. The thing turns and looks at him. And now you got to keep in mind, this is this man's mother. This is how afraid he was. And he stops running. He said, man, this thing looked at me like it was going to kill me. He was like, dude, I ain't going to lie. I was scared. Of course, it's the mother who ended up running this thing off. She takes her walking stick and she just starts swinging it and screaming. She said, I, it didn't matter. I just knew it wasn't going to take me without a fight. And son says when she starts doing that, it looks back at her and it stares at her like, what the hell is this woman doing? The insane thing about this whole encounter is as she's swinging that stick and being as brave as you can expect a person to be under those circumstances, this thing looks at her and backs back into the wood line. 
And he says he watches this thing back. It doesn't turn around and walk away. It just keeps stepping backwards into the wood line. He grabs his mother by the hand. They cut through the trees. Because you got to walk around the path to get back to the park area. They cut through the trees across the park to the parking lot in the car and they leave. And they haven't been walking in that area again. To me, the story was just like, almost was like, I thought it was an exaggeration. Not even an exaggeration. To be honest, I thought the story was a lie when I first heard it. Based on how exciting and how excitable she was when she was telling the story. But what I've discovered about this woman, and I alluded to this earlier, is I've discovered that although she's blind and has to have a walking stick, and she's probably the most happy person that I've ever talked to. I mean, the kind of person that when she calls me, it's like, hey, Dark, what's going on? Like, raises my spirit. So um, I can say that I'm truly honored and blessed to be able to share her encounter. I believe her encounter is 100% true. I'm happy that it worked out the way it did. And, you know, guys, I'm, I kind of stray.